So yeah, we had a, a week off last week. So let's uh, refresh our memories. We are in chapter 14. 14. Very good. And we're continuing discussing the Benini. We began discussing the Benini in chapter 12. And we're continuing to discuss the Benini. Are we still talking about the Benini? Yep, we're still talking about the Benini. Awesome. That was 13. 12, 13, and 14, and even 15 is still about the Benini. Yeah. Yeah. Sefer Shal Beninim, and that's what the book's sure, about. We waited yeah. a long time. Waited here. a long time to get here. Um, yeah, we in chapter one we brought up the idea that there's Tzadik Rasha Benini, and we didn't really find out what they were until chapter ten. We explained what the Tzadik is. In chapter eleven, we explained what the Rasha is. In chapter twelve, we explained what the Benini is. We started explaining what the Benini is. There's another question from chapter one that was left over that's going to get answered in this chapter. I mean, it's Hashem, uh, we'll learn today. But um, do you remember from chapter one where we asked, one of the questions we asked was, how come Eov, Job, oh. said to Hashem, not in uh, the book of Job, but in Agarata, in Bava Basra, in the Gemara, he says, Rebbeinu Shalelem Barosa Tzadik and Barosa Rashaim. Hashem, a master of the world, you created Tzadikim, you created Roshayim. And one of the questions we asked was, well, hold on, is anyone created, in other words, destined to be by dint of their very creation, either Tzadik or Rasha? Aren't Tzadik and Rasha the product of free choice? And uh, we didn't tzadikism. resolve that. Well, we didn't, we didn't... What do you mean? You said Tzadikim are sprinkled. We didn't... Uh, we, we didn't... Uh, answer the question yet no. no but we will today we will today at any rate what were we talking about we we're talking about <laughs> the fact that a tzaddik not only he doesn't do things that are not not mitzvahs but he doesn't even want to do things that are not mitzvahs in fact the whole concept of doing things that are not mitzvahs turns him off he finds it unappealing. And that's not something you can just will yourself into. You can't just decide, well, I want to be turned off by anything that's not a mitzvah. That's not something I have control over. And the good news is the Bainini, the definition of the Bainini is that uh, he doesn't have to be turned off by things that are not Hashem's will. He can actually be attracted to things that are not Hashem's will as long as he maintains behavioral control. Sounds familiar, everything we're saying? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So where, where we left off We left off right after we said that he doesn't uh, despise that which is not Hashem's will, not like a tzaddik who actually despises it. Betachlas sina, or yafilo shaloi betachlas sina, either completely or incompletely. Those are the two levels of tzaddik that we spoke about in chapter 10. And now let's continue. Hinei i lamitai. This, meaning to despise that which is not Hashem's will, you can't fake that. It's impossible to really do that just at will. Ella al yedei goydul v'toykef ava Hashem. The only way that's possible to truly despise that which is not Hashem's will is to have an opposite love for Hashem. Bebechines ava batainugim on a level that's described as love of delights, to delight in Hashem, on a level similar to the delight the souls will have in the world to come. In other words, what he's saying like this, and we, we spoke about this in chapter 10, if you remember. We said that the love of Hashem is commensurate, or it's equally uh, or inversely proportionate to the 
disgust with things that are not Hashem's will. So he's, he's bringing up that idea again, and he's saying, to really truly say, um, doing something that's not a mitzvah is disgusting to me. That, only, that feeling only sincerely exists within somebody who has an incredibly powerful love of Hashem, a level of love of Hashem that we describe, Ava Batanugim, it's a scriptural phrase from Song of Songs. King Solomon is speaking romantically about the love of Hashem and the Jewish people, and he describes that love as a love of delights, a blissful love. So he's saying basically, if you're a tzaddik and you have this blissful love of Hashem, which is compared to the blissful love of Hashem that the souls in heaven have, okay, then it's possible that you'll also be legitimately turned off by things that are not mitzvahs. But if you don't have that level of blissful love of Hashem, then don't be shocked if you're not revolted by things that are not mitzvahs. Maybe you're not revolted by them. In fact, not only you're not revolted, you're, 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 maybe you're even interested in them and you find them attractive, but you know that it's not appropriate, so you stop yourself. You understand what he's doing here? He's distinguishing between the emotional reaction to non-mitzvahs. I'm calling it non-mitzvahs because he's not just describing sin. Sin is like, you, you went all the way to the point of sin. No, he's not even talking about sin. He's talk, just talking about non-mitzvahs, like things that are mundane, but they're not being elevated for any particular purpose, and they're just being done indulgently. To a tzaddik, that's absolutely disgusting. But where does that disgust come from? It comes from the fact that his love of Hashem is so powerful. So the two things are like two sides of one coin. Yeah. That is a really smart question. How do I know it's a smart question? Because he answers it in one line from now. So if he answers it in one line from now, he must feel like that's where you should be headed. Okay. So let's. the question is, where does that love come from? Like this love we just described, that the tzaddik has, this blissful, delightful love. Where does it come from? Great. Okay, so let's continue. Okay. Um... Regarding this level of love of Hashem, our sages have described it as being able to taste or preview the delight of the world to come while still in this world. Not everyone is able to merit that, to say the least, not everyone. Because that level of delight in Hashem is not something that you can go out and attain on your own. It's actually a reward that's given to you. And then he quotes the words, it is a service of a gift or a gift-like service which I give to to, well, he calls them kunaschem, the the uh, those who serve him. But yeah, the main point is it's a matona, it's a gift. So answering your question, this crazy high level of love of Hashem that we're saying is really only the domain of tzaddikim. Where does it come from? It's a gift. It's so high, it's so lofty, you can't generate it on your own. It has to be given to you. And in the case of tzaddikim, after they've achieved everything that can be achieved, everything that's humanly possible to achieve, then Hashem gifts them with this special level of delight in Hashem. What's the difference between that, the gift of the love of Hashem and the gift of even serving Hashem, even that's a gift to some extent. Well, they're different gifts. But it's still a gift. So Everything's a gift. So one gift is dependent on another. Pain is a gift. Okay. Yeah. That's the Ahav Rabbah. Don't, well, you're showing off. You're showing off. <laughs> you're 100% correct. That is, I'm, that is 100% correct. Okay. Can you make yourself... That level, you? hold on. I, I, I'm... I'm impressed with myself as a teacher. <laughs> yes, that is called Avaraba. The level of Avabatanugim is synonymous with the level called Avaraba, 
which means abundant love. And though, the, uh, how do you remember that? You're a good teacher. I, I'm, I'm really impressed. Okay. Yes, Avabat Hanugim and Avaraba are, are synonymous. They're, they describe the level which, of love which is gifted. It's gifted because it has to be gifted. <coughs> 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 because it's not attainable through, uh, through n- normal um, efforts. efforts. Yeah. No, 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 no. Not all the levels. No, no, no. This is a special level of love that is only attained through gift. And then naturally, when they have that level of love, which is called love of the lights, then the flip side of that is they will be despised or they will despise anything that's not the service of Hashem. Okay, so then what about the Benoni? He doesn't have that. That's our point. The Benoni doesn't have that. The Benoni does not have that level of blissful love of Hashem, and he doesn't have the commensurate disgust with things that are not for the service of Hashem. He has some level. Some level. So how did he get that? Oh, how did, okay. So that's a good question. We haven't spoken... Right, you, no, you're asking a good question. We haven't yet spoken about where to get feelings, where to make feelings, or how to generate feelings. We haven't spoken about it. All we've spoken about so far is impulse control. We said, the brain rules the heart, and you can sort of just ignore your emotions, and even when you want the wrong things, you can just force yourself to do the right thing. Now, later in Tanya, in fact, coming up pretty soon, we are going to talk about how to generate feelings. But right now, at this point, we're we're saying the whole Hiddish, the the newsflash about the Benini is that at least in theory, he doesn't have to even worry about emotions. He can bypass the whole thing and just focus on behaviors. At this point, that's what we're saying. Later on, we're going to talk about how he can also generate feelings. But even when he learns how to generate feelings, he'll never be able to generate this particular feeling because this particular feeling, which is called the love of delights or avaraba, is not something that any human effort can generate. Okay. Commission is born makam acha, like we'll explain, or like it is explained elsewhere. Velachin amar iyev. Okay, here's the answer to the question from chapter one. That's why Job said, "Barasa tzadikim chulu Hashem, you created tzadikim." What does it mean? You created tzadikim. That sounds like you created people who are destined to be tzaddikim, well, we thought that people have moral free choice. Which one is it? So he explains, like it's brought into Kune Zayar, there are many different types and levels of souls within the Jewish people. It's not monolithic. Ksidim, some are called pious, gibedim, some are called mighty, those are the people who overcome their Yitzhahara. Maritaira, the scholars, Nevi'im, prophets, Chulu, etc. Tzadikim Chulu, righteous ones, etc. Ayn Trump, go look there in the Tikkun Isaiah. The point is there are different types of Jews. And it comes from different types of souls. There are people who were created with the potential to be tzaddikim. Not that they're forced to choose this path, because obviously everyone has free choice. But there are those who were given the potential to reach this if they make the right choices. Whereas, there are people who do do not have that potential, and therefore there's nothing wrong. They're not failing when they don't reach that potential, because that's just not the track that they're on. Behaviors. Behaviors. We're judged based on our behaviors. Caps what ability? Behavioral ability? And of course not. 
There's no cap to the behavioral ability. Behavioral perfection is attainable by everyone. That's the whole thesis here. What's unattainable by everyone is this level of emotion, which is unique to the tzaddik. So when 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 Eev said, or even becoming a tzaddik, it's almost unattainable for us. That, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Attainable for us is to become a benini, right? That's what I mean. But but, but we cannot a become tzaddik. a tzaddik right. because Hashem created people who have that ability. Then obviously they have to exercise the right choices to cash in on that. But if you weren't endowed from the very beginning with that ability, which is fine because Hashem created all different types, like the Tikkun Isaiah says, then try as you will, you're not going to reach that level. But that's fine because we're on a different track. We're on the behavioral track. And we can reach behavioral perfection. And we can even choose the right things consistently when we don't feel like it. When we do so through impulse control and willpower. No, I don't love it. I'm not going to pretend I love it. But I can force myself to do it because I know it's right. That's what he's saying here. The tzaddik is this strange bird who actually loves doing the right thing and is revolted by doing the wrong thing. He was born a goody-goody. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. And the, by the way, you see, the, I'm not talking about actual tzaddik Rosh but metaphorically, you could use those terms loosely. You see with different kids, even in one family with different personalities, the kids who are naturally more compliant and obedient and it's easy for them to do the right thing, and the kids who struggle more. Um, so that's why you should never judge another person because you don't know their That's true too. That's true too. Yeah. 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 I'm having problems understanding how two Sadiqians can be doing the same thing and one be gifted and one not. You said that, huh? No. No. If you're a Sadiq, you're, you're, it's not automatic. You have to still be gifted, no? Gifted the emotional connection of that, that extra love. That's all. What we're saying is that if someone has that level of love, you can know for sure it was given as a gift. They didn't earn it themselves because it can't be earned. That's what we're saying. Now I'm more confused. You're more I thought confused. to get that gift, you have to have earned it. You have to no. have a complete set. Not what you said. No. You have to do everything you can do and then, after you've done what you can do, there comes in this gift, which is a total bonus. It's a bonus. You didn't earn it. You couldn't earn it. Kind of like on the slots when you get the free cherries or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How does that love manifest itself in the world? <laughs> Sorry, but that's what How does it manifest itself? How does it, right, what does it look like? Well, he said very clearly what it looks like. It lo- it's a love of delights. He walks around in love with God all day. And conversely, he's disgusted by anything that's not the service of God. Okay. Guys, this is not that difficult. I thought we were talking about the Bainanese. Why are we discussing Yeah, don't worry about it. Let's move on. Okay. Exactly. All right. Now we can understand another thing. An interesting thing back from chapter 1. Remember when it said in the beginning of chapter one? Remember Tanya Saif Pere Gimel Danida? The very beginning of Tanya, chapter one, that we learned in the end of chapter three of Gemara Nida that before the soul comes down to the world, Meshbi and I say they give him a, an oath. They administer an oath and they tell him, be a tzaddik and don't be a rasha. Sounds redundant. Be a tzaddik and don't be a rasha. Okay, if I'll be a tzaddik, automatically I won't be a rasha. Remember that back from the very first line? 
So now the Alter Rebbe says, finally in chapter 14, he says, now I can sort of understand why that oath is phrased that way. Be a tzaddik, don't be a rasha. Why say both? If I'll be a tzaddik, then I won't be a rasha. Automatically, if I'm being a tzaddik, I'm not a rasha. So he explains. The reason that the, the oath has those two parts is it implies a certain nuance which creates another category that's neither tzaddik nor rasha. In, in other words, namely, bainani. Somebody who attempts to be a tzaddik, because that's the first part of the oath, be a tzaddik, okay, I'll try. He hits a wall and realizes, and by the way, when I say he hits a wall, that wall is not behavioral, because behaviorally he could achieve anything. But I'm saying emotionally, he hits a wall where, like, I can't get myself to love every mitzvah that I do. And I can't get myself to hate every non-mitzvah that I don't do. So I hit a certain wall. I can't be a tzaddik. Fine, no problem. Just remember, don't be a rasha. In other words, don't give in behaviorally. So watch, watch how he explains. The <coughs> l'chayra Seemingly, it's wondrous. It's confusing. Since he already said, since the oath already says, be a tzaddik, why does it have to say, seemingly redundantly, don't be a rasha? Allah, but rather, here's the answer. Not everyone's going to merit to reach the level of tzaddik, which, as we said, is an emotional distinction. He's not going to be able to reach that emotional level. A person doesn't have so much free will about these things. Free will about behaviors, sure, but not about emotions. So he can't just will himself to do it. He can't just force himself to truly have delight in Hashem. And he can't force himself to truly be disgusted by that which is not for the service of Hashem. He can force himself to do what Hashem wants and not do what Hashem doesn't want, but he can't force himself to love it or hate it, to love the stuff Hashem wants and to hate the stuff Hashem doesn't want. He can't force himself. V'lochet, therefore, mashbiim sheinis, there's the second part of the oath, al tirosha, al koponim, so then at least, no, don't be a rasha. You understand how it's phrased? Be a tzaddik, okay, I'll try. And then when you realize that you're not going to be a tzaddik. Okay, so then default to, then at least don't be a rasha. Now you're going to ask yourself, if that's the point, then I, then I have a new question. Then just skip the tzaddik part. Just say, don't be a rasha. Why say be a tzaddik? If we know most people are not going to reach that. And, it's not, it, it, and if that's not who you are, you weren't created that way, it's, it's not a failure if you don't reach it. But, you have to aim but what? You have to aim higher. You're saying that intuitively, that it makes sense, that you, know, that you have to shoot higher than, yeah. I, I saw once a video of Viktor Frankl giving a lecture, and he was talking about learning uh, how to fly a plane. I guess he was an amateur pilot. And he was saying that when he was flying the plane, he learned that you have to correct for the wind. So you actually have to aim far to the extreme away, like you have to overcorrect because the wind pushes you back and then you end up in the middle. <laughs> so he said that if the human being tries to be a human being, he'll be less than human. <laughs> but if he tries to be more than human, then maybe he'll be... A mensch. So that's sort of what it's saying here. Yeah, you have to reach higher than the realistic goal. Um, yes, that's part of it. And, and, and even more. And even more. And we're going to find out what does it mean to try to be a tzaddik even though we know it's unattainable. And I just want to check in with everybody. We all understand when we talk about a tzaddik, that word, that title, that designation, when we use the word tzaddik, 
is describing somebody with special what? Feelings. It's not special behaviors, because a man has those behaviors. We're talking about someone with special feelings. So when we talk about tzaddik, or the distinction between tzaddik and benini, we're speaking purely about emotions. Okay? That's clear? All right. So let's continue here. So he says, at least try not to be a rasha, because regarding behavior, a person does have free will. He does have free will. He can rule over the spirit of lust in his heart. He can conquer his inclination. And he can manage to do this perfectly so that he'll never give in and be a rasha even one second his life, in his life. Whether it's sins of commission, that he's avoiding doing the wrong thing. I'm sorry, whether it's sins of omission or it's... Uh, Maybe that's not the right way to say it. Whether it's avoiding that which you're not allowed to do. And whether it's things that you must do. And when we say things that you must do, that primarily means constant Torah study, unceasing from Torah study. The study of Torah, which is tantamount to all mitzvahs. Everyone has the ability to behaviorally Always do what you're supposed to do and never not do what you're not supposed to do. And that's what it means, don't be a Rasha. Afalpikein, now nevertheless. Or ach afalpikein, however, nevertheless. He's going to flip back now and say, don't forget about the try to be a tzaddik part. You should set times to attempt to get yourself to despise ra, meaning non-mitzvah stuff. We know that you'll never truly be aligned with that, because that's the domain of a tzaddik. But you did, after all, agree to the oath, and therefore you have to do your part to try to change your emotions. Even though we know that you're not going to succeed. But you did make an oath, so you're going to have to try your best. And then when you don't reach the goal, then you'll default to the second part of the oath, which is at least don't be a rasha, mean, meaning at least control your behavior. So now he speaks a little bit about how a non sadic can try to get himself somewhat aligned with some of the tzaddik feelings. And we said, to oversimplify, the tzaddik feelings here our delight in Hashem and disgust for anything that is not the service of Hashem. Yeah? Do tzaddikim realize they're tzaddikim? Do they know? I don't know. Probably. Probably, I don't know. In chapter one, it said that uh, Rabba was a tzaddik and he thought he was a Benini, so maybe yeah. not. I don't know. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, do they have empathy for. For non sadikim yeah, yeah, sure. I've, I've said this before. The only people who will hate you for sinning are the people who are jealous of your sin. The people who hate being from and wish they didn't have guilt will hate you for sinning. I, I've said this before. Sadikim have the most avas Yisrael. Sadikim don't hate people for sinning. Sadikim have compassion on people who are so... Uh, no, because that's not the point of this class, but I'll, I'll just say it. A tzaddik, a tzaddik is not attracted to sinful stuff. He knows it's garbage. And he sees, Nebuch, this guy, that's what, you, that's what you're enjoying. 
so sad. So he has compassion on them. He tries to help them. But then the guy who says, I hate eating healthy. I wish I could eat cake all day. How dare you eat cake in impunity? I hate those people who eat cake. Well, because you're jealous. You wish you could eat cake. Then there's a healthy guy who says, no, I don't even want cake. It's gross. It's so sad. Look at that guy. He's eating cake. His, his, his body craves that kind of garbage. I, I wish he were free from that. Anyways, but that's, that's not the point. I've said it before. I said it, I think, in chapter 10 when we talked about the tzaddik. You remember me saying No. no? Said it now. But we're, go- we're coming up upon something controversial. Where the Altareb is going to help us to attempt to have tzaddik-like pleasure and tzaddik-like disgust. A bainu, regular person. Attempt, that's why I stress the word attempt. Because we're not going to really reach it. But he says to set times to try to simulate it. So that. So, so that you do your best in fulfilling the first part of the oath of be a tzaddik. Even though I know I won't complete it, but I should do my best to try to complete it. And then when I don't, I'll default to the second part of the oath, which is behavioral control by not being a rasha. Or not being a rasha by maintaining behavioral control. Okay. So he says there are certain ideas that Chazal share with us that are meant to help us be turned off by physical pleasures. Because normally um, we're into physical pleasures. I mean, that's just... Um, if you want to get really, you know, if you were a materialist and an atheist and a naturalist, you would say there is a biological advantage that uh, the species should want to do things that propagate the species, like eating and procreating. And so we're just given an animalistic desire to do those things. But uh, if you want to say it in a more spiritual way, you could say it like this. Um, We have two souls, and the animal soul we learned about in chapter 2 is concerned with uh, self-preservation. And uh, that aim towards self-preservation sometimes goes to an extreme to the point of self-indulgence. And it seeks comfort, it seeks pleasure. It seeks the easiest, most accessible comforts and pleasures, meaning bodily stuff. Because that's just, like I said, easy. (laughs) It's it's easy. And uh, yeah, so procreation and eating. Eating and procreation. I mean, you want to sell anything, you know, those are the things you sell. Those are like the, 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 those are the triggers of the, of the animal. Eating and procreation. Those are the two things. And uh, people seem to really, really think those things are really great and be really, really into it and excited about it. And the sages tell us to step back for a second and get a little bit of objectivity and think about the fact that these things are not so gewaldic even though we understand that the animal soul is wired to be very excited about these things. But if you just stop a second and look at it objectively, you could realize, hold on a second, this is what I'm getting all excited about. This is what's so exciting. So our sages give us um, advice how to look at these two things, eating and procreation. in a way that sort of sobers us up. So he says here, and I'll I'll, I'll read what he says, and it's, it's, it's always taken controversially, but I don't think it should be controversial. (laughs) He says, Kagain, for instance, Batsas Chazal, you should think about the advice that our sages give. I'm just going to read and translate. Isha, a woman, is a vessel full of excrement. 
Ukehai Gavna, and the like. So that's not controversial. <laughs> okay, let me unpack this. I mean, by the way, those who can't see, I'm explaining this now to a predominantly female audience. <laughs> by the way, some misogynist, I'm assuming is a misogynist, because that's he wrote a comment on the YouTube saying, why do I always hear women in your class? <laughs> because there are women in the class. <laughs> Should they be silent? <laughs> so, yes, these women, sometimes they actually ask questions. Sometimes they, yeah? Okay, so... Look, it says it, in, it says in the Gemara, we, and we don't have to shy away from it, we just have to explain it. Um, we all understand what it means to objectify human sexuality and to com- make it a commodity. And uh, I think we also understand, for whatever reason, I'm not here to figure out why life is the way that it is, but uh, when the car company wants to sell the car, so they, they have the girl standing next to the car. I mean, we all know that women are objectified. That's just, I, I didn't start it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree with it. I'm just making a statement that that's, okay? Men are also objectified. But disproportionately, women are objectified. And uh, he's speaking about, I mean, the Gemara is speaking about this idea where this really crass, perspective where a person is looking at a woman in a very reductionist way, just in the most materialistic way, and the Gemara is saying, hold on a second, this is what's getting you excited, this is what's like triggering your animal lust, stop a second, take a step back and realize if you really want to be reductionist, if you really want to take this human being with a mind and a personality and a soul and a life and experiences and reduce them to biological functions, then let's go all the way with this and let's get real. You want to talk about biological functions? Let's do it. And it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be so sanitized. This is not your airbrushed version for the, uh, for the, for the, for the, for the advertisement. You want to get real? You want to be reductionist? You want to reduce somebody to biological functions? Okay. So that's what Chazal is saying, like, if you're going to take that point of view of a human being, then let, let's, let's look at what it really is. And look at the next line. This is also from the Gemara. He says, they go hand in hand. They're the same idea. He says, kol elam haza. Also, all pleasures of this world. Specifically, he's talking about eating. Mehen. A wise person will see what comes of them. Shesaifen lirkoiv. They rot. They become compost. They become garbage. So it's the same thing. Like, what are you all excited about? Oh, we're going to go to Italy. Oh, what are we going to do in Italy? We're going to eat. There's so many restaurants. Okay, so you're going to spend $50,000 to fly across the world so you can munch a bunch of dead cells and then put them into a toilet four hours later. That's what you're going to spend. Because that's what it is. That's what you're doing. If you, you say, I got to try it first before yeah. I put it down like yes. that. Okay. Yes. He's saying like this. The Gemara is saying, <laughs> if you want to start getting excited about physical pleasures like procreation and eating, and you want to just focus on the just the 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 the, the, the most bare minimal physical things, devoid of any content, devoid of any deeper meaning. Okay, fine, so then let's get real. What are you doing? What are you talking about when you're talking about these mechanical functions of the body? If you're not going to flinch, you're not going to look away, you're going to look at the whole story, it's not so, I mean, it's like, we all have this incredible desire to eat. It's one of the hardest things in the world to overcome. And yet, if you picture what food looks like when it's all chewed up in your mouth, it's not appetizing. It's not appetizing. So, but why do we get crazy about that? Okay? So is this a new diet method? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah. Right. But he doesn't enjoy Yeah, but you have problems enjoying it? No, no, no. I don't have a problem enjoying it. Well, balance? I, I think, I, I, yeah. Listen, I don't think anyone here is in danger of risking, oh, I'm going to do these little meditations from the Gemara, and I'm going to lose my animalistic desires for physical bodily pleasure. It's, you're not in danger. Okay, that's not the danger here. What he's saying is the opposite. He says, go for it. Go ahead and try. You're not going to succeed. That's fine. Try. That's the first part of the oath. Be a tzaddik. What's a tzaddik? I said before, a tzaddik is a purely emotional designation. It's talking about how you feel about serving Hashem and not serving Hashem. So he says, try to get yourself to be turned off by things that are just empty physical indulgences. Try. Try as hard as you want. You'll never totally get there, and that's fine, because when you fail to totally get there, then you'll just go to the second part of the oath and at least control your behaviors. Does this make sense? Okay, it's not complicated. It's All right. Vahefech, and then the opposite, because we're talking about being turned off by physical stuff. What about being turned on by spiritual stuff? So the opposite, lisanig, v'lismeach b'ashem, try as much as you can to get yourself excited about Hashem, where it actually feels pleasurable to serve Hashem. How? Al yidei izbainis b'gdula saints of baruch kfi yecholte. Meditate as well as you can, according to your capacity, in the greatness of Hashem. Try to get yourself to appreciate Hashem. Try to get yourself to feel something. And of course, you're not going to get all the way there. We already said that. But get yourself a little closer than your default. Even though you know deep in your soul that you'll never truly reach that level. <laughs> kind of harsh. He says, you may imagine, dimyon means an imagination, you may imagine once in a while, ah, oh, I've rid myself of these desires. And then, you know, you wait a minute later and you're like, uh, hold on a second, that looks interesting. Oh, okay, I thought I was free from this. No, no, for a minute you were. For a minute. You thought you were. Even though you'll never truly despise physical indulgence for its own sake, and you'll never truly delight in serving Hashem, nevertheless, who yases shalai, you got to do your best, you got to do your part. to at least do something toward the first part of the oath of be a tzaddik, which be a tzaddik really means if we spell it out, be delighted by the service of Hashem, be turned off by meaningless physical indulgence. Okay, I know I'll never truly get there, but I'll do my best. And then when I fail, I'll go to the second part of the oath, don't be a rasha, which means maintain behavioral control. Okay? All right. Now, after that, he says, you do your part, v'hashem yase hatoiv be'enov. Hashem will do what is good in his eyes. What does that mean? That sounds kind of promising. <laughs> like, maybe something could happen. Maybe something could click. Where I... Maybe something will happen more than... I mean, it sort of implies some hope there. Or you could read it the other way, too. <laughs> Hashem will do whatever he says is good. Meaning, all right, that was nice. I'm glad you tried. No, that's it. That's all, that's all you're going to get. That's, that's as far as you're getting. But in a moment, he's going to spell out for us, and I don't want you to rely on this, but he spells out a possible outcome that could happen for a Benini who did his or her best to reach that 
emotional level. V'ayt. Shaher galal kol davar shiltain v'nasa tavasheni. Habituation can become like a second nature. So it's not your nature. Your nature is that you're attracted to physical pleasure. And you're not automatically excited about serving Hashem. But you've simulated these emotions so often that it becomes as if that were your genuine reaction. Which is worth something. It's worth something. It's more than a habit because he's saying it'll actually... See, a habit is purely on a behavioral level. He's saying it could actually affect you emotionally to some, to some degree. Is it like fake it till you make it? Fake it till you make it, yeah. yeah. Now, you, are you going to totally make it? No. But fake it till you get closer to it. If you accustom yourself to despise... Ja, not just to not do it, but to be turned off by it, or to tell yourself you're turned off by it. Yeah, nimos kitzas be'emes. Then it a little bit will become true. A little bit will become true. Not a lie. He says kitzas, a little bit. Uchiyargo lesameach nafshe ba'ashem. Aydeis bonus begdulas Hashem. And if you accustom yourself to delight in Hashem by thinking about the greatness of Hashem, through an arousal from below will come a response, a reciprocal response, an arousal from above. Then maybe, maybe, just maybe, it'll arouse a spirit from on high. And he will merit lebechinas ruach the ruach, the soul level of ruach, you know, this nefesh, ruach, neshama, the ruach of a tzaddik. You remember nefesh, ruach, and neshama? In fact, I'm, I'm not sure in this, this class if we've ever spoken about this. I think we've, in fact, I don't think, no, I don't think we spoke about it because I think generally we've just, been, for the sake of Tanya, it's not so important to distinguish between nefesh, ruach, and neshama. We just use the terms, we simplify them. But nefesh, is the spiritual energy which animates action, behavior, uh, vital functions. Ruach is the spiritual energy which animates emotions. Neshama is the spiritual energy which animates intellect. These are three levels, one higher than the, than the previous one. You have action, emotion, cognition. Nefesh, ruach, neshama. So the ruach is specifically the soul level connected to. I thought there were five levels. That well, there's three levels which are invested within the soul. Then there are two two more levels that are so lofty they don't get in, I mean, invested in the body. Then there are two levels that are so lofty they don't get invested in, in the body. That's chaya and yechia and yechida. They don't they don't get invested in the body. Yeah. Um, but the level of ruach is emotion. So the ruach of a tzaddik means the spiritual energy that belongs to a tzaddik that gives the tzaddik his emotions, that can come and impregnate. That's the literal translation. Shittisaber boy means he can become impregnated with that ruach. Lave de Shem Besim Chamitas to serve Hashem with true joy. Meaning it's not his joy, it's the impregnated ruach of a tzaddik, or it's rather the, t- the ruach of a tzaddik which impregnated him and gave him tzaddik like emotions to serve Hashem with true joy. You know that there's Gilgul, Dibuk, and Ibur. The Arizal speaks about these things, different ways that one soul can. Come back. So one is Gilgal, reincarnation, where a, one soul will come back into a new body. Dibuk, I'm sure you heard, you know, Dibuk, yeah. yeah, is where one soul who's left its body doesn't want to leave, so it grabs somebody else's body in a hostile takeover. 
Ebor is impregnation, where there's a symbiotic relationship between one soul and another soul. So this tzaddik, in a friendly way, shares his ruach with this benini, and this benini who did his part as best as he could to fulfill the oath, be a tzaddik, meaning he tried as much as he could to have delight in Hashem and to be disgusted by that which is not for Hashem. And he did his part, and then, and we're not guaranteeing this will happen, but he says it could happen. The ruach of this tzaddik will sort of dock itself in this bainni and give the bainni those advantages, namely this tzaddik like emotion. Yeah? It's positive, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't say any. Spe- it doesn't say a specific tzaddik. And does it remain there permanently thereafter? I don't know. I, I don't know. These these kinds of things are very. Uh... The question is, could it be a Sure. Why not? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's finish up. We have two more lines. Um, one more line. Kedeksiv simchu tzaddikim ba'ashem says in Tilim. Tzaddikim, rejoice in Hashem. And what the Alter Rebbe is saying here, to really rejoice in Hashem, that takes a tzaddik. And then in that case, this Benini will be able to actually fulfill the part of the oath that says be a tzaddik. By this fluke of being impregnated by the Ruach of a tzaddik, now he will be able to reach that level of be a tzaddik, which means be genuinely delighted by the service of Hashem and genuinely repulsed by not serving Hashem. But even if that doesn't happen, even if you don't have that happen to you, you still have to do your best to fulfill the first part of the oath. Try your best, he said, to think about the fact that bodily, physical pleasures are fleeting. There's nothing to get so excited about. And think about the fact that Hashem is great and awesome and He is worthy of being excited about. Will it move the needle a little bit? Yes, it will. Will it take you all the way to tzaddik levels of emotion? No, we're not expecting that. We're not trying for that. But at least we'll do our best. And then when we, we've done our best, we go to the second part of the oath. At least don't be a rasha, which means... Choose the right behaviors. That's the end of chapter 14. Okay? You don't find it that motivating? What part of it? What's not motivating? Like, keep trying, keep trying, but you're really not going to get But it's still a good level. You want him to lie to you? You want him to lie? You know, you don't have to be perfect at everything. It's okay. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, you just got to be your best self. You got to be... Okay. So is the bonus we were talking about, is that different from the Ebor, the friend you take over? Yeah, that's different. That The, the Ebor happens for a Benini. The, 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 the Matona happens for a Tzaddik. Yeah, yeah.